Hey everybody, welcome to Daniel production channel Nam to Sunauga. My name is Daniel, this is my mom Diana and to... Bye, don't move our <laughs> camera, please. And today we will react to geography now again. Uh, this is Singapore. Singapore. Yeah. Uh, you requested it, we yeah. know. So let's watch it. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't done this yet. Put thumbs up, write comments, share this video with your friends. Don't forget about notification bell. Uh, also, you can be our sponsor, the link is in the description, and by the way, I made uh, the second channel, it's in Russian but with English subtitles, yes. на заметку or uh, for a note, or you can watch it, the link will be in the description too, I hope you will like it, uh, little education uh, videos about everything, uh, so let's enjoy it. Alright, Singapore. If any of you guys saw my older videos, you'll know I had the amazing experience of visiting this country a couple years ago. My Singaporean friends Nigel, Ben, and Kevin will be appearing again in this episode. I will say, I get why Singapore is such an internationally renowned hotspot. It's a small country with big ambition. It went from a few dilapidated wooden stilt homes and boating fishermen to literally a boat on top of three skyscrapers. Either way, one thing's for sure. Singapore definitely isn't Singapore. <laughs> Singapore. Is it my turn? <laughs> now, hey everybody, I'm your host Barbs. Welcome to the Jewel of Asia, the only place in the world to have gotten their independence against their will. We'll get into that later. But one thing you can do on your own will is get a Geography Now mug or t-shirt or drawstring bag at geographynow.com. It's not selling out if it's my brand. Oh sh**. In any case, get ready because we're about to look at the globe and find this gem of a nation in three, two, guys. Singapore, or Pulau Ujong. Anyway, it's the world's only island city-state. Something is clearly happening here, so let's go no. to the globe. First of all, the country is located in Southeast Asia, just at the southern tip of the Malay Peninsula. To the west, you have the Strait of Malacca, and to the south and east, you have the Riau Islands of Indonesia. Singapore is made up of one main island, Singapore, which makes about 95% of the country's landmass, as well as 63 other smaller satellite islands and islets. More are actually set to come, as they do extensive land reclamation projects, creating new artificial islands. In fact, to this day, Singapore has actually increased its land mass by 22% since independence through land reclamation. In fact, if you look over here at the Tuas Peninsula, you can even see it is currently being reclaimed every day and is set for completion by 2030. Over here, Jurong Island was actually a merger of seven previous islands reclaimed into one and is now used as an industrial complex. Besides Singapore Island, though, only two other islands are residentially inhabited, Pulau Ubin and Sentosa Island. Otherwise, the rest are used for other purposes like the military, laboratories, wild wildlife sanctuaries and so on. Now the country doesn't exactly have any official administrative divisions, but when it comes to building sections, there are five development councils that cluster communities together, mostly for government housing projects. When elections come up though, they do have group and single member constituency neighborhoods. These areas are allotted a certain number of seats in parliament so as to allow a somewhat balanced representation of people groups in the country. Although the country is only about 725 square kilometers in size, making it the 20th smallest country in area, they actually have a lot of air transit. Transport. They have seven military wow. airports and airstrips and two public airports. Yes, two. Everyone thinks Singapore's yeah. Changi International, voted the best airport in the world for several consecutive years wow. in a row, is the only one. But if you go just 16 kilometers north, you'll find this hidden little guy, Selatar Airport. It operates flights to Indonesia and Malaysia, as well as private flights and a flight training school. Otherwise, the country has an incredibly complex and highly operational network of roads, rail lines, and shipping docks. There are two bridges that connect to Malaysia over the Johor Strait. You have the busiest one going into the city of Johor. Johor Bahru at the Johor Causeway Bridge in the north, and then you have the second link bridge toll road that enters into the west side. People usually take this road to go to Legoland, Malaysia. After Shanghai, Singapore has the world's second largest shipping container port, able uh -huh. to transport nearly 40 million containers ships. annually. From there, many other commercial ports are used for the public, like Afton. the Harbour Front Center and the Afton. Marina Bay Cruise Center. Now you can't talk about in Singapore Asia. without mentioning the MRT, the oldest, busiest, and most costly right. rail system in Southeast Asia. It also has the longest driverless network in the world world and some of the deepest subway tunnels in the world. And finally, fun fact, Christmas Island and the Cocos and Keeling Islands were at one point a part of Singapore under Christmas British Island. rule, Christmas then were transferred Island. to Australia in 1957. Wow. For real though, the airport is so cool. <laughs> so, going back to infrastructure. Singapore is yes. kind of internationally renowned for having very strict laws when it comes to things like car and home ownership. Basically, all cars are required to have an IU, or in-vehicle unit, a device that's installed in the windshield and is basically a prepaid account that has money deducted from it when you drive under the 
ERP toll passes. On top of that, owning a car is pretty difficult enough as it is. Here is Ben to explain. Um, the government highly advocates for the use of public transportation like the buses and the metro system, which in Singapore we call the we call the MRT. And on top of that, in order to regulate um, the number of car owners and the number of cars on the road, in Singapore, if one wants to buy a car, we not only have to pay for the car itself, we have to pay for the certificate of entitlement. And that certificate, that piece of paper, can go up to $30,000. And that $30,000 actually varies according to the season. Because what happens is this COE of the goals by a balloting system, and this COE lasts for a period of 10 years. After 10 years, you have the option of renewing the COE for another five years or you have to scrape the car and get a new car and get another new COE for another 10 years. So ta da da Crazy Rich Asian. And Ben, about home ownership, explain. How does it work in Singapore? What's the HDB? Go. If I am not wrong, I think 90% of the land here in Singapore belongs to the country. HDB is in charge of building apartments, build apartment buildings for um, most Singaporeans to live in. So about 80% of the Singaporean population. And these flats or these apartments, um, we may say that we own it, but technically it's a lease for 99 years. But considering that the country isn't even 99 years old in itself, nobody quite knows exactly what a completion of lease would look like, but yeah. And that is how we manage to, you know, keep everyone for nice information. Yes. Thank you, Ben. Ben. This means yes, housing yes, operates easier and faster because you don't have to worry about red tape issues like department approval or ordinance laws. Basically, the point of real estate in Singapore is you buy to live, not really to invest. Yeah, you will never see one of those HGTV flipper shows airing here. In any case, time to move on to the famous places segment. The Fountain of Wealth. Orchard Road has like the best shopping. Chinatown with the street market and Buddha Tooth Relic Temple and Museum. Kampong Glam with Haji Lane and the Sultan Mosque. Little India with the Mustafa Center and the Sri Viramakali. Yaman Temple, Halpar Villa, Universal Studios, the Night Safari, the Henderson Waves, Jurong Safari. Bird Park, Marina Bay Sands, and the Rooftop Infinity Pool. So many museums, cemeteries, and art galleries, and probably the most iconic landmark, the Gardens yes. by the Bay, yes. the Super yes. Trees, yes. and the Cloud yes. Forest, yes. and Flower Dome. Yeah, those super trees are really cool. I was lucky enough to see them when I visited. It's crazy how much Singapore puts an emphasis on coalescing concrete with nature. Which brings us to... <laughs> Now, Singapore gets its name from the word Singapura, derived from Sanskrit meaning Lion City, even though there's no lions here. Nobody knows Lion exactly City. why it's called Singapore then, but the more popular theory comes from the Malay annals claiming that this guy sailed here, and in the 13th century it was like, whoa. I think I see a lion. Is that a lion? No, there are no lions in this part of the world. That must have been a tiger. No, nah, too late. I already saw it. I already made up my mind Singapore. So yeah, that's basically <laughs> it. In any case, for Singapore, with limited space comes limited environmental responsibility. Here's the uh, motion graphic. First of all, as the country is heavily urbanized, Singapore has lost about 90% of its historical forests, and the majority of what's left is found either in the Sungai Buloh wetland or the Bukit Timah Nature Reserve and the surrounding green areas in the center of the main island. Speaking of which, here you can find the highest point, Bukit Timah Hill, at about 163 meters tall. Bukit this notable Timah. area in the center of the country has the most well-known freshwater reservoirs that supply the inhabitants of the country, like the McRitchie Reservoir, the Central Water Catchment, and the Upper Selatar Reservoir. However, it is this one, the Lower Port Pierce Reservoir, that is the source of the longest river of the country, the Kalang River, which is more like a controlled still creek flowing about 10 kilometers down to the largest body of freshwater, the Marina Bay Reservoir, which is actually fed by five rivers. This reservoir this reservoir alone supplies about 10% of the country's freshwater needs. It started in 2008 with salt water, but then in two years they desalinated and drained the remaining salt water. The freshwater bay is contained from the saltwater sea only by a narrow dam called the Marina Barrage, only about 10 meters wide. Keep in mind, this guy over here, the Pandan Reservoir to the west, contains more water and surface area, but the water is non-potable and is used to service the industrial sector. As the island only lies about one and a half degrees north of the equator, they have a tropical rainforest climate with relative uniform temperatures throughout the year. However, for nine months of the year, they experience two monsoon seasons between November to March and June to September. On top of that, they have an average 84.2 humidity level, and it's not uncommon to go up to 100%, especially on rainy days. There's even a saying, by the rain, by the sweat, either way, you will get wet. It's like 
Florida. I'm like Florida man, I think. Yes, Keith, you you are Florida man. But what is worth <laughs> though? As the country becomes more urban and developed, they are trying to preserve as much nature as they can. Which is kind of a challenge. I mean, it's like skyscrapers coming up everywhere. What are you going to do? One very creative way they've been doing so is through the tactic of fusing their concrete and steel foundations with living hedges of flora. What the hell am I doing with my hands? To explain more, <laughs> guess who's back? <laughs> Noah! Just uh, to about that. I'm back. Let's get to it. With Singapore, the very continuity of their country depends on balance. They have taken many steps to integrate vertical greenery and as much space as they can. You can see this in many places like the mm, Oasia Hotel downtown, which literally has vines growing all over the grilled exterior. Wow. In addition, there actually are a few small plots of land designated for agriculture, mostly in the northwest quadrant of the country. Here there are over 2,000 farms, averaging about two and a half acres each. Nonetheless, they invest heavily in the finance, technology, business, and service sectors. The country puts a huge emphasis on encouraging entrepreneurs with free trade policies and easily accessible government grants and funds. They have the third least corrupt economy with low tax rates. In addition, all workers under 55 are required to give 20% of their wages to the Central Provident Fund, which is a social savings fund like a pension. Employers give 17% of earnings. So long story short, these are some of the main factors that made the country so prosperous so fast. And speaking of fast, here comes our animal correspondent, Gary Harlow. Here we are with Puppy Howard. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are. It's for you. <laughs> Special for you. You would think that animals would have no way of thriving here, but you're wrong. Don't you forget it. Because of the climate, Singapore is still able to host over 60 Hell of this guy. nearly 400 bird species, My about 110 reptiles, 30 amphibians. Most of the animals live in one of the five established nature reserves. Four on the main island and one on Palo Wild. <laughs> 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 The most yeah. common mammal you'll probably find are long-tailed macaque monkeys. Macaque. If you're lucky, you might come wow. across one of the incredibly rare Sunda pangolins. Sunda pangolins. Pangolins. In the western yeah. areas, you can find yeah. olives. Singapurski pangolins. <laughs> <laughs> What? Nonetheless, out of all these real animals, the national animal of the country is the male lion, a fictional creature that's half lion, half fish. Yeah. Speaking of legendary creatures, we go back to Noah Gildemaster, the master of guilds. Thanks, Gary. So, Caleb, I say, uh, that's great that, number. it's the time you hungry okay. people have all been waiting for. Food! Singapore takes food seriously. Let's put it this way. Some people come into Singapore just for the food. Now, usually, I take on this segment, but Singaporean Kevin knows his food. So I'm going to pass this over to him. Kevin, take it away. So over here, we have an incredibly rich history of mixing different flavors from our different people groups. And some of the best places to try this is what we would call a hawker center. A hawker center is basically a big food court that's filled with many many stalls or push carts for people to choose different foods from. Some of these small venues are even Michelin star rated. There are over 107 hawker centers in Singapore but the largest one is the Chinatown Complex Food Center that houses more than 260 mini stalls. The next time you come to Singapore you have to try some of our local foods. The ones that we're most well known for are laksa, chicken rice, rojak, chocolate tao, Hokkien mee, chicken clay pot rice, chendol, ice kacang, roti prata, murtabak. By the way, nobody here actually drinks the Singapore sling. It's basically a tourist you can make. Thanks, Kevin. Delicious, yeah, I lots think. of fusion with yes. Singapore. Let's discuss more on that in the next segment, shall we? Oh, why, thank you, Mr. Noah. In the words of fiction writer William Gibson, Singapore <coughs> is like Disneyland with a death penalty. It's shiny, it's pretty, it's clean, it's efficient, but it does kind of come at a cost of heavy restrictions and somewhat authoritarian and technocratic protocol. This kind of puts Singapore in a weird state of, like, prosperity at the cost of certain societal compromises. It's a hard topic to address because there's so many layers that go into it, and I suggest you just talk to a Singaporean if you want to know more. On top of that, everything kind of functions in full fours. Clearly you could tell by now there's nothing in here. I'm just using it as a prop. Sad, I know. We'll get more into that in a bit. But first, the graph. Singapore has a population just under 6 million and often ranks as the number one or number two spot for the country with the lowest fertility rate on oh, Earth with only about 0.9 children per couple. Million. It also ranks number one as the most competitive Lots economy on Earth with a spot in the top five highest North GDP Korea's per capita countries as well. <laughs> the largest group of people in the country identify as mm -hmm. ethnically Chinese, but keep in mind this number also includes an undetermined percentage of people that are mixed with Chinese, like the Peranakan. From there, the next largest group are the Malays, somewhere around 13.5%. Keep in mind this category also 
also may include Indonesian migrants that register as Malays though. And the third largest group are the Indians at around 10%, mostly South Tamil and Malayalam speaking Indians. Malayalam. However, keep in mind, this registered mm -hmm. category may also include general Indian subcontinent individuals from other countries like Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. From there, the remainder of the population are other groups, mainly Eurasians, Caucasians, Japanese, Koreans, Filipinos, Asians? and Vietnamese. They use the Singapore dollar know, as their currency, which by the way is pegged and interchangeable with the Brunei no. dollar. They use the Type G plug outlet and they drive on the left side of the road. Remember, they were once a British territory. The country has four <laughs> official languages, each pertaining to the main ethnic groups. They are Mandarin, Malay, Tamil, and English. Oh, oh Mandarin. Mandarin is Chinese. Chinese. And there's technically a fifth way really? of speaking. Singlish, which is kind of like an English Creole that makes like it all of languages. In okay, India. here's the guys. Singlish. So in Singapore, there is a local slang that's called Singlish. Thai English, Singlish, Singlish. 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 Thank you guys. Now, in a way, you can kind of see Singapore as a tri-ethnic or plurinational country. Kind of like Belgium with the Walloons and Flemish, or Bosnia and Herzegovina with the Serbs, Croats, and Bosnians. Actually, Bosnia and Herzegovina is not the best example because all three are basically the same thing. But you get the point. And the country is kind of calibrated to preserve this social structure. Like, you're required to register your ethnic group on your papers and passport. This has been kind of like a slight inconvenience for some people of mixed ancestry, like the Peranakan, which are kind of like descendants between Chinese and Malays. And they're kind of like their own unique people group. However, these days, more people are mixing ethnic lines and giving birth to biracial children. This has led to them adding a mixed race option on paperwork in 2011, mm -hmm. which adds a whole new dimension to society. And uh, yeah, here's Nigel explaining a little bit more on that. Today, the four most common languages are English, Malay, Chinese, and Tamil. Now, these languages can be seen on the street signs, advertisements, and public notices. We also have dialects, which are spoken but unwritten languages. In school, students are taught the importance of racial harmony. And we also have a day which celebrates this diversity. Our history began with the Malays as the first inhabitants. People from China, India, Europe, and other countries started settling down in the early 19th century. When it comes to housing, it's quite natural for people to want to live in a community where their neighbors speak the same language and share the same culture. But to prevent ethnic enclaves, an ethnic quota was implemented for public housing. So a certain ratio is assigned to each block denominating the percentage of Malays, Chinese, Indians, and other races. And by doing this, none of the three major ethnic groups were disadvantaged. Every race is now represented in each neighborhood. Thank you, Nigel. Yeah, the racial quota. Unfortunately, this also means depending on your race, it could be easier or harder to buy a home depending on the location. It's kind of like a weird thing that nobody really likes to talk about, but everybody knows that race can kind of be used in this way in Singapore. It's, it's the way how it is. In any case, all of this is obviously enforced through the government, which is kind of like a tight semi autocratic one-party system called the People's Action Party. It has been the dominant party since they forcefully gained independence against their will. That's right, after the British left in 1959, they deliberately wanted to unify with Malaysia, but then it was like, seriously, you're imposing a 20% revenue contribution hike on my fiscal input and have imposed the Bumi Putara policy? Pretty sketchy, what? dude. <laughs> well, this is Malay territory, and you did want to join our federation, and even after we agreed on a level of autonomy, you still had the nerve to be an indignant little that's not possible no Whatever because you listen if you if you, you look at the facts, so the facts okay the that's it i'm kicking you out parliament vote no i just wanted to negotiate different terms what are you doing no no it is with great sadness that i must announce that our little island has now gained independence a little exaggerated, but literally Lee Kuan Yew was like sad during his announcement. He was even quoted for saying it was a moment of anguish. But any Huan Faith-wise, the nation is also quite mixed up as well. The largest group being Buddhists at around a third of the country. The second largest group is actually Christians at nearly a fifth of the country's population. And from there, Islam comes in at third at about 14% of the country. Rounding out at number four, about 7% are Hindus, mostly from the Indian community. So yeah, that's that. All right, enough from me. In any case, now it's time for the sports part. Usually art fills in for this segment. 
sense, but he is literally driving back to LA. He's coming home, and uh, as you know, he can't film while he's in a car. So we need a substitute, which means uh, we're gonna need someone to come in. I guess it's gonna be you, Ian. Ian, hey, go on for right. the sports part. Sports part with Ian. As a small country that puts more of a cultural focus on business and finance, sports are usually pushed off with less of a national priority. Nonetheless, everything from bodybuilding to badminton can be found here competition-wise. Their soccer, or football team, were four-time winners of the AFF Championships. A. Hey, otherwise, you can see native sports too, like foot volleyball, or sepak takra, foot volleyball. and the martial uh -huh. arts like native to Indonesia Stay. and Malaysia, are often done here as well. As an island nation though swimming and water related activities have always been their specialty nothing was more glorious for the country when joseph schooling was able to not only compete with but beat the man he looked up to michael phelps in the 100 meter butterfly event at the 2016 olympics we still love you michael phelps you're awesome well thanks for having me art sorry you're not here good luck driving uh but do the speed limit thank you ian yeah. oh, I need and he wow. The cool thing about Singapore is that the people all kind of bring something to the table that everyone can enjoy on a national level. Enough on that from me though, it's time to hand the reins over to our culture correspondent, Random Hannah. Party people, it is good to be back. Yeah. So as mentioned, Singapore is a diverse country, but there are a few things that kind of unite them all. It's said Singaporeans all have the five great fears. Kia Su, meaning the fear of missing out, FOMO. Kia Si, meaning the fear of death. Kia Bo, fear of having nothing. Kia Cheng Hu, fear of government. And Kia Bor, meaning the fear of your wife. <laughs> or no. <laughs> I think that's probably a good thing. I don't want you to be afraid of me. This is why Singaporeans are known for having two favorite pastimes, queuing and choping. They hate missing out. It is said that if there's a long line, it has to be for something good. You don't even have to know what the line is for. And chope is the art of securing a seat during meal times at restaurants. It's a mad dash. Every man and woman for themselves. To reserve a seat, people will usually place cheap personal items like a pack of tissue or a pen to claim a table. We totally do that year. Due to the former colonial ties to the British, you might notice much of Singaporean culture is anglicized. For example, many people may choose to give English first names to their children. In addition, much of the traditional architecture is a fusion that blends hints of British and Asia. None more exemplified better than the 20th century style shop house. These narrow structures are known for having covered walkways called five foot ways to help residents stay dry during the rain while shopping. Certain festivals are celebrated by everyone too like the Heritage and Food Festivals in July. Their version of Black Friday is called the Great Singapore Sale, where things go up to 70% off. I like that. And you can't forget their national day, August 9th, commemorating their independence. Singapore also, in a way, has a culture of appreciating discipline. Crime rates are very low in Singapore, partially because ramifications can be severe and corporal punishment is common and accepted, even in schools. Sometimes Singapore is called the fine city because you can get fines for certain things like, oh, I thought I meant fine, <laughs> fine. You can get fines for eating or drinking on the MRT, playing loud, annoying music in public, chewing or selling gum unless it's Bye. prescription. Also, technically, Singapore does not have a complete freedom of speech. Even when making debates at Speaker's Corner in Hong Lim Park, they must register the topic with the government prior to speaking and are still monitored. Nonetheless, the country moves forward pretty well, even amidst these seemingly harsh policies. They want to maintain order, and for them, the best way is to do it this way, the Singapore way. The one person that will never be in order is Keith. So here is Keith's music segment. <laughs> Okay, disclaimer, by the way, I love Funkadelic, they're an amazing band. George Clinton is an amazing yeah. keyboard player. Due to fair use law, don't sue. That's my commentary, goodbye. The music culture of Singapore is special because it takes influences from the Chinese, Malays, and Indians. In the early 20th century, traditional Chinese street opera troops would set up and perform either in music clubs or during festivals. The art has declined in the past few decades, but you can still find some performances being done, especially at the Chinese opera, Institute or the Chinese theater circle near downtown. For the Malay community, it's not uncommon to hear ensembles performances called Dong Dong Sayan and Keron Jong. 
These are usually done at special events and weddings. For the Indian community, South Indian Raga ballads are not uncommon. And North Indian Bhangra dances are usually seen at special <laughs> events as well. In a more contemporary sense though, in the 1960s they basically had a wannabes Beatles band, you know what I'm saying? Can't buy me love. Just kidding, kind of. Artists started to experiment with bilingual lyrics and pop music in bands like Crescendos and October Cherries for a while in the 1980s and 1990s, a new genre inspired by Taiwanese country music called Xingyao swept Singapore by storm. Today, pop music has become a more progressive genre with many artists singing in English. They even <coughs> won the first and only season of, you know, Asian Idol. I could only imagine the Asian Simon Cowell. Ha ha. Recently, many metal bands like Iron Maiden, Slayer, and Dream Theater have made Singapore a stop on international tours, which has led to a new interest in metal amongst the teenage angsty youth. In any case, the most important venue for musical performances today would be the Esplanade, located right on Marina Bay downtown. All right, that's it for me. My name is Keith, and as you can see, we have these wonderful Keith shirts. You can wear this shirt on a train and maybe even a plane. Later! Thank you, Keith and Hannah. Whew. And now, famous people. We're just gonna kind of rush through this. Historical and political figures like these. There's a lot of actors like these. Remember Jet Li got citizenship? DJ Kygo was actually born here too. And for authors, you know, the guy who wrote Crazy Rich Asians. Asians, and there's a lot more. And speaking of crazy and rich and Asians, let's talk about Singapore's diplomatic outreach, shall we? Singapore has virtually no conflicts with any other country, and today they have diplomatic relations with 189 countries. For what's worth though, they know how to play the global chessboard pretty well. For one, they are a member of the Commonwealth of Nations, which of course opens up their ties to 54 other nations across the world in shared cooperation treaties. Generally, other Anglophone nations get along with Singapore all around the world, from Africa to the Caribbean, back to Europe. This means, of course, that the UK is a close ally. They have a mutual defense agreement called the Five Power Defense Arrangement, which includes Australia, New Zealand, and Malaysia. They are the fourth largest investor in business with high levels of stock ownership. Many Singaporeans also either study abroad in the UK or even have family and live in the UK. The USA is a huge partner with a free trade agreement and the military cooperates frequently. Singapore's Air Force has a detachment in Arizona's Luke Air Force Base and the US Navy is allowed to use Singapore's ports. China and specifically Hong Kong are both very close friends, obviously as the majority of the population in Singapore are of Chinese descent, mostly of the southern parts of China like Fujian, Guangdong, and Hainan. Collectively, China and Hong Kong are also the largest trading partners, right. reaching about $100 billion in revenue. Nonetheless, relations kind of fluctuate depending on how much interaction Singapore has with Taiwan. Singapore does have military facilities in Taiwan, and in 2004, they put bilateral relations on hold when the former prime minister took a private trip to Taipei. Hong Kong, though, is kind of like the cousin across the sea, as both were former UK colonies, and they have very similar structures in the way how they function with business and government. India, of course, is a close friend as well, not only due to the for a population of Indians in Singapore, but with huge economic ties as well. In the 90s, India initiated the Look East policy, in which they decided to expand its commercial, cultural, and military ties to Southeast Asia. With that, it's probably safe to say the closest countries to Singapore would probably be their fellow ASEAN members, more specifically Malaysia and Indonesia. Now, of Indonesia and Malaysia, there is kind of like a sieged mentality of past unfavorable events, like the Borneo conflict of 63 that Singapore was kind of mm -hmm. dragged into, but they've generally moved on and moved forward. All all three countries operate along the Strait of Malacca, the busiest choke point of trade in the world, so they all kind of have to work together. Indonesia is the third largest trading partner and in 2005 signed a Memorandum of Understanding. Lots of important resources come from Indonesia, and many Indonesians get along with the Malay Singaporeans as they have very similar cultures. Malaysia, on the other hand, is kind of like the divorced wife that decided to stay in a business relationship. They are the second largest business partner. Each country is able to easily cross borders and immigrate. The Malays often have family on the other side and intermarry. Singaporeans love crossing into Johor to shop, where everything is like a quarter of the price it would be in Singapore. And overall, the awkwardness of the breakup is pretty much non-existent to this day. All three of these countries are solid together. By the way, I just realized one of you guys sent me this hat. I should have worn it for the whole video. In conclusion, with Singapore, everything is kind of about balancing, you know, infrastructure, nature, culture, and the future with the right amount of negotiation, compensation, and discipline. It's just kind of how they do things here. Stay tuned, Slovakia is coming up next. Okay, Slovakia. Okay, thank you, thank you for recommending this. Yeah, thank you for recommending yeah. this video. I like this video and, and I like also geography now, but one thing, uh, there are a lot, a lot of information. 
if I would like to do something like this, I uh, cut uh, this uh, from one uh, one part, one day about one part of Singapore life, mm. uh, second day about history, yes, nature, history uh, about yeah. uh, sightseeing. And I like sightseeing of Singapore. I would like to go there. Mm? Yes, uh, sightseeing is very beautiful, especially mm -hmm. trees with. Yes. Uh, Flora, yes, uh, it's very interesting yeah. kind of archi architecture. Yes. And uh, one it's thing, amazing. it's interesting mm -hmm. that uh, in Singapore there is uh, the statue of uh, Kajol. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the circuit. Uh, yeah, and uh, by the way, Kajol's uh, daughter, Nisa, she studies uh -huh. in Singapore. Ah, oh, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so. I also like one statue, Lion and the Fish. Oh, ah, one yes. half lion and one so half fish, it's a very, very unique very symbol, I think. Yeah. Yes, it's great. Mm, interesting. And uh, uh, so, mm -hmm. a very, very interesting video, and I would like to go to Singapore <laughs> right now. Yeah. Right now, I would Subscribe like to, go. to this channel if you haven't done this yet. Yeah, Put thumbs that's... up, write comments, share this video with your friends. Don't forget about notification bell. Can't have a very good feeling, it's just a chill day.